Hey guys, so um, I'm trying a new setup right now. I have my phone taped to um, a yardstick, which is stretched across two giant stacks of my biggest books and textbooks so that I can have kind of a vertical perspective and we're just gonna see how this works out. Uh, what I wanted to do today was flip through some field guides. So, um, if you don't know, uh, this is an example of what a field guide looks like. It is used to identify animals when you're out in nature. Um, so, say you're out birding, you see a bird, you don't know what it is, you can flip through and uh, either try and identify it based on the picture, or if you know what you're looking at, you might want to look up the animal to learn more about it, to see um, what their range is, or uh, see what it might look like as a female versus a male, or a young versus an adult. So um, we're going to start today with this. This is called the Sibley Field Guide to Birds of Eastern North America. So I live in uh, Eastern North America and um, birds will uh, vary pretty differently between this half of the United States and the other half of the United States. So if you are going birding, um, like in California, Oregon, Nevada, you're going to want to get a completely different field guide because you're not going to see most of these. Uh, so, if you open it up, um, the first thing it has in here are uh, parts of a bird. So, um, I don't actually know all these terms super well. Uh, you can get very uh, technical with things. Um, let's look maybe at the feathers. So birds have primary feathers, which are kind of um, like at the tip of their wing down to halfway. Their secondary feathers are in here. They have underwing coverts and axillaries. Then you go the breast, the sides, the belly, the flanks, uh, the vents, the undertail coverts, the tail. Um, as you can see, there's tons of other parts to learn about birds, even just on the head. So, the crown is the top of the head, the eyebrow is kind of the feathery parts right by the eye, um, you have the throat, you have the cheek, and this can help you when identifying birds because the field guide will say something like, it has a yellow crown, it has a striped breast, um, you see a flash of white on the primaries, and you kind of need to know where all these parts are to help you know what you should be looking for on the birdies. So we will start with um, something from the dabbling ducks and diving ducks section. So let's look at the green-winged teal. This is Anas Kreka, its scientific name, don't know if I said that right. Common in very shallow marshes and flooded fields or on mudflats found in small groups, but may gather into large numbers. Feeds mainly on seeds picked from surface of water or mud. Our smallest duck, stocky and short-bodied, with relatively small, slender bill. Breeding male distinctive, with dark head and white vertical bar on side of breast. Female very similar to blue-winged teal, but note smaller size, smaller bill, darker and more patterned face, an obvious pale buffy streak on tail coverts. Voice. Female clack, feeble and shrill. Male in display gives ringing, whistled, creed, or crick. Um, so you can see this map here shows where they live. Um, let's see. There's a key at the beginning. So 
The blue is winter, the orange is summer, the purple is year round. So um, they spend the winter down south, which makes sense, the summer up north, um, I guess year round here, and I think the yellow, they will migrate kind of in these Great Lakes states. So let's look at the picture. Um, this is a juvenile, an adult female. An adult male, wow. Look at that. So it has this uh, reddish head, this green patch on it, kind of a, a cinnamon colored breast, and it's gray with some yellow. Um, this is what, this is the same sex, so this is male in the non breeding season. So um, birds will tend to not put their energy into making crazy colored feathers unless they need to. So when they want to attract a mate, they'll look like this. When they don't need to, they look kind of like the female. So the female is you know, brown. Um, she has this tiny little green patch. It's probably why they're called the green wing teal. And uh, juveniles look pretty similar. And then it shows you what they look like if they are flying. Okay, now we are in uh, the falcon section. So we're going to look at the American kestrel, uh, Falco sparvarius, uncommon in many open habitats from desert grasslands to meadows to brushy fields, often seen on roadside wires or fence posts pumping its tail. Nests in tree cavities, bird houses, or crevices in buildings. Solitary, hunts within small range, mainly for insects and small mammals from perch or by hovering and dropping straight down. Our smallest falcon. Oh, I keep picking the smallest of each kind of bird. Uh, this is just random. Small size, habits, and rufous color are distinctive. Its voice is a shrill, screaming, killy, killy, killy. Um, so let's see, back to our colors. They are year-round in, it looks like, most of the U.S. And they uh, also will spend the summer up in Canada, the winter um, way down at the bottom of the U.S. So I think these are really pretty birds. Um, So the male kind of has this like red back, gray wing, and then a tan yellow belly. Uh, the female doesn't really have the gray, but she kind of looks similar otherwise. And when they're flying, um, you'll get this distinctive blue-gray wings on the male. Uh, they're pretty cute. I've seen them, never photographed them. They are pretty small, and I have typically seen them while driving through more rural areas, and they'll be perched on telephone pole wires, and I kind of am speeding past, I'm like, oh, that's a kestrel, and I'm too far ahead to stop, and I don't want to just pull over on the side of the road. Those sandhill cranes. I actually saw these yesterday. But they're, they have a com complicated life pattern, so I'm not going to talk about them right now. Well, let's do an owl. Okay. These ones are super cute. So this is the northern sawwet owl. Again, I picked the smallest. Oh my god. <laughs> this is not on purpose. Okay. Uncommon in wooded areas. Mostly mixed coniferous and deciduous woods. Nests and tree cavities. Nocturnal. Roosts during the day in dense foliage. Hunts at night for small mammals. Solitary. The smallest northern owl. Fluffy and large-headed. Note prominent white V on its face. I guess you can kind of see that here and there. Um, 
broad brown streaks on underparts and white spots on scapulars. Its voice is a song, a series of low whistled toots, toit, 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 repeated two times per second, and a wheezy, rising cat-like screech, like shree. Um, so you can see their range map here is kind of more complicated than the others we've seen. Um, I know at least from living in the Midwest, the Mid-Atlantic, when we have them around sometimes, they are super cute, really small. Um, these are what the adults look like. They do have these kind of big heads, um, and yeah, I think, I mean, they might look like a typical owl to you, but if you saw them next to another owl, you'd realize how tiny they are. Let's do a warbler because they're one of my favorites. Um, let's see if we can find a really cool looking one. Okay, this is one of my favorites here. The black-throated blue warbler. So this is Dendroica cerulescens. Um, cerulescens, kind of like cerulean, it gets you to that idea of blue common, nearly always in shady understory within woodlands. Nests in mixed carnivorous, not carnivorous, coniferous, sorry, and deciduous woodlands. Male unmistakable, and really this, it looks like no other bird. Female more difficult to identify, they always are. Um, note plain drab olive color with whitish undertail coverts and dark cheek with narrow pale eyebrow, yes, that there, and lower eye arc. Most females have a small white patch at the base of their primaries, which you can see right here, which the males also have. Their voice, song a lazily drawling, husky but musical buzz, zoo zoo z. And that's true. Um, this is one of the birds that I actually can identify by its call, and you'll hear it's like zoo zoo zoo. Um, and yeah, they have some other calls. So. Uh, I have seen them over in uh, the Midwest. They're really, really pretty. So these are the males. Um, they're mostly blue on top. They have a black kind of face mask. They're white underneath. They have this little white patch. Um, when I was out birding once, someone described it as they're carrying a little handkerchief, which is really cute. Um, and these are the females, which look like a lot of other warblers. Females are so hard, especially with warblers, to identify. Let's see? Okay. How about um, a Baltimore Oriole? So uh, it's called Icterus galbula. Common in open deciduous woodlands or among scattered tall trees, solitary or in small groups. Forages widely for caterpillars, fruit, and nectar in low brush and in trees. Note the bright orange color, white wing bars, which are these. Um, and they kind of have lines going this way on the wing. A slender bluish bill and mostly orange tail. Their song is a short series of clear rich whistles, pidu. 2D, 2D, U, and many variations. Um, so the adult male is really easy to identify. Um, bright orange, black head. The females, um, see they kind of have the same black and white on the wings, but they're kind of like grayish, yellowish, and um, so it's usually the males of most birds that are going to be really bright and colorful and it's harder to identify the females. Okay, um, it's been about 15 minutes. I'm going to switch to another field guide. So this one is by Peterson Field Guides. 
It is reptiles and amphibians of Eastern and Central North America. Um, I do have the Western North America one because I spent some time working out West uh, with desert tortoises. So I got the Western version because um, I think in the West it's more likely you're going to come across reptiles and amphibians anyways, especially reptiles. Um, so, open this up. one's a little different. It doesn't have the pictures um, with the text, so you kind of have to see the pictures and then it'll tell you where to go. Um, let's start. Why don't we start with the Blanding's turtle. Okay. So this is what a Blanding's turtle looks like, here and here. Um, so the top part of the shell, like what's on top, the dome, this is called the carapace. The bottom is called the plastron. And uh, with Blanding's turtles, what stands out is they have this bright yellow chin and throat. Um, we're going to go to page 188 to learn more about them. The Blanding's turtle, oh my god, reptile and amphibian names are even harder than birds' names, Amidoidea blandingi. Um, as you can see, they only live in kind of the Great Lakes states. They're actually um, like threatened in a lot of their range. So these are about five to seven inches long. Uh, apparently they're called the semi-box turtle. Um, the hinge across their plastron, remember that's the bottom of the shell, lets um, them pull the bottom to close well upward towards the carapace, but it's far less complete closure than in box turtles. The profuse light spots often tend to run together, forming bars or streaks. Bright yellow on chin and throat is a good field character that's easily seen through binoculars when the turtle basks or floats at the water's surface. Essentially, aquatic, but often wanders about on land, although seldom far from marshes, bogs, lakes, or small streams. Usually hisses sharply when picked up in the field. Named for William Blanding, an early Philadelphia naturalist. So, um, I have seen these in the wild. Um, it's true, I saw the yellow on the chin, and I knew immediately uh, what I found. I was really excited. It was on a log in the water, so I did not pick it up. I don't know if they hiss or not. Um, okay, salamanders. These are my favorite group of animals, probably, and what I did. I now do this project on... Hmm, I can't even choose. Let's look at the cave salamander, which is one I hope to find and have not yet. Um, these are pretty much bright orange salamanders with uh, black spots. We will go to page 493. Ooh. Get a real picture of them. See how cute they are? So cute. This is from Kansas. They are called um, Eurycia lucifugla, uh, four to six inches long, a reddish salamander with a long tail, um, favorite habitat is the twilight zones of caves, near entrances where the light is weak. These salamanders, which are excellent climbers, move about on the formations of the cave and ledges, sometimes clinging solely by their prehensile tails. They also occur outside caves and may be discovered beneath logs, stones, or debris in wooded or fairly open places. 
don't think it gave us a range oh, up around this side. So I can find them here. It's actually a smaller range than I thought, just kind of Missouri, Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia, Southern Indiana, and Ohio. Um, there are a bunch of big cave systems there, so that makes sense. Let's see. Maybe... I think we should do a snake. Who do I want to pick? How about a ring neck snake? I really like these guys. Um, so there are the southern and northern ring neck. Um, they have, if you can see, a little colored ring on their neck, which helps you identify them, and an orange belly. Um, I'll go to page 330. Um, so the northern ring neck snake a secretive woodland snake, usually most common in cut-over areas that include an abundance of hiding places in the form of stones, logs, bark slabs, or other rotting wood. Rocky, wooded hillsides are also favored. Many people believe ringnecks are young racers, which is another kind of snake. Small salamanders are important food, oh, but earthworms and small snakes, lizards, and frogs are also eaten. Um, and the southern is the same. It looks like they're actually the same genus and species, Diadophus punctatus, um, with a, like a subspecies that breaks them into two. I'm not actually sure which I've seen. It looks like... I guess I've seen them in North and South Carolina, which seems to be probably the southern ringneck. I feel like I might have seen the northern too. Maybe we'll do one more. How about a frog? Okay, let's do um, the gray tree frog. So I, um, growing up, didn't even realize we had tree frogs in the United States or where I lived in the Midwest. Um, there's all these kinds. And I, I kind of thought they were like a tropical thing. Um, definitely like Florida has a lot of them, but we, there are some in the northern U.S. too. So we're going to do the gray. Um, so these are kind of like blotchy frogs. They can be gray like this or... Um, sometimes they look more like this green color, and they kind of have these like darker blotches on their back, um, the sticky toe pads of a tree frog. And we'll go to page 536. Okay, so there's two species, Hyla versicolor and Hyla chrysocellus. Um, they look very similar, and it's really hard to tell them apart. Um, and you can tell them apart by their voice, but it's difficult. And here is a picture of a real one. And as you can see, their range, they are um, pretty much all across the eastern United States. So, not often seen on ground or at water's edge, except in breeding season. Many forage aloft, chiefly in relatively small trees or shrubs that are near or actually standing in shallow bodies of water, extremely well camouflaged when clinging to bark of a rough tree trunk. Often their presence is known only when they call. So I've um, actually never seen one of these in the wild. Um, sometimes people will find them like clinging to their windows or garden um, plants or patio furniture. Um, I just don't think I've ever lived in good enough habitat for them to be in my yard, but they're definitely around where I've lived. Um, 
they kind of have a weird uh, like alien sounding call it also kind of sounds like a bird um kind of trilling and yeah so normally gray or green but can vary can be gray brown green pearl gray or even almost white and i think they're cute i would love to see one So obviously, uh, both of these books have hundreds of species. Um, this is related to my line of work and what I'm really passionate about. So if you guys want to see more, um, I could make many more videos flipping through these field guides. These are the two most kind of official ones that I have, um, but I have smaller ones that are specific to certain states. Um, that I could go through. I also have a giant book of plants. Uh, it's not in color though, so it's a little more boring. Um, yeah, hopefully you learned something, and I'll probably make more of these in the future. I also, uh, um, take a lot of wildlife photographs, and I will probably make videos kind of just paging through photographs, um, in the future show you those. There's probably going to be a lot of animal content on this channel because that's what I think about all the time. So I uh, hope you have a good day or night and I will see you in another video.